Yep. Super. Good afternoon. My name is Ryan Moorhart, and welcome to our press conference, CEPI, Building a Global Coalition to End Epidemics. Welcome to those here in the room with us at our annual meeting in Davos, and especially welcome to those from, uh, viewing from around the world, viewing online, hopefully from somewhere nice and warm. The Forum's 2019 Global Risk Report, released last week, details a new era of epidemic risk, one defined by an increasing number of epidemic events and a society more vulnerable to the, the related health, security, and economic disruptions. It was in this context that two years ago, here in Davos, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, CEPI, was born. And today we are gathered to share progress that CEPI has made. And so, it is our pleasure to welcome on our panel here, Paul Stoffels, Vice Chairman and Chief Scientific Officer at Johnson & Johnson. Lydia Ogden, Associate Vice President of Global Enterprise Policy at MSD. And Jeremy Farr, Director at Wellcome Trust. And finally, Richard Hatchett, the first uh, CEO of CEPI. So Richard, could you get us started? Would you mind introducing CEPI, CEPI's mission, and some of the progress that you've made? Sure. Thanks for the introduction, Ryan. It's great, great to be here today, two years since CEPI was inaugurated. CEPI was charged with developing vaccines against some of the world's most dangerous diseases, diseases that WHO has identified as high priority threats. Over the last two years, we've had constant reminders of the importance of our work. In 2018 alone, we have struggled against two outbreaks of Ebola in the Democratic Republic of Congo and are still struggling against the second. We have experienced the most deadly outbreak ever of Lhasa fever in Nigeria. And we saw Nipah travel more than 2,000 kilometers from the next closest location to cause an outbreak in Kerala, India. In fact, in May and June of 2018, the world contended with simultaneous outbreaks of six of the eight diseases highlighted in the WHO's list of priority epidemic diseases. These included Ebola, MERS, Zika, Nipah, Lhasa fever, and Rift Valley fever. Epidemics turn the world upside down. The fear they cause can drive communities to desert the weak, to shun the sick, to bury their dead without ceremony. And epidemics cause economic damage, again driven by fear that can be vastly disproportionate to the level of illness caused. In our hyper-connected world, epidemics have the potential to hop from continent to continent, spreading far beyond the places where they emerge. We have seen this over and over again. And the number of outbreaks seems to be increasing for a variety of reasons, ranging from our increased connectivity to high density living in, in dense cities to increased deforestation and incursions into previously remote areas. As Ryan mentioned, the World Economic Forum has again highlighted biological risks, underscoring how they are evolving and transforming in this year's Global Risk Report. WHO has included Ebola and other high threat pathogens in their list of 10 threats to global health in 2019. We ignore epidemic threats at our peril, and CEPI is proof that the world has not turned its back. In 2017, here in Davos, five investors, Norway, Japan, Germany, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and Welcome, with the support of the, of the Forum and of India, provided CEPI's first contributions. Since that time, the European Commission, Australia, Belgium, and Canada have also made contributions. Ethiopia and Rwanda have signed memoranda of understanding with CEPI, and the government of Ethiopia is preparing a financial commitment. In the last few weeks, we have been pleased to announce that both Canada and Australia have renewed their commitments. And today, I am delighted to announce that the United Kingdom has joined CEPI with a generous contribution of 10 million pounds. British science and innovation have long contributed to the fight against disease, and we are already working closely with teams from Oxford and Imperial on potentially game-changing new vaccine technologies, as well as with the UK Vaccine Network and the UK Vaccine Manufacturing Innovation Center that was announced last month. So what other progress can CEPI point to in the last two years? Two years in, CEPI has nine partnership agreements established with partners ranging from academic institutions to biotech firms to large multinational corporations. Across these partnerships, CEPI is supporting a portfolio of 17 vaccines. We have committed over 270 million U.S. dollars to develop vaccines against Nipah, 
Lassa, MERS, and other diseases. In recent weeks, we have expanded the number of pathogens we are working on to five, issuing our third call for proposals and inviting submissions to develop vaccines against chikungunya and Rift Valley fever. We have also announced our first investments to tackle disease X, the disease we don't know about, the emerging disease with the potential to cause a pandemic, through partnerships with Imperial College in London and the University of Queensland in Australia. The platform technologies they are working on have the potential to transform the way in which we develop vaccines. If they work and early in indications are positive, we are looking at reducing the time it takes to develop vaccines from years to decades to weeks to months. In coming weeks and months, we will be announcing more partnerships to fight disease X, Ebola, and other diseases. Soon we will initiate the first clinical trials of vaccines supported by CEPI. This will be a tremendous milestone for the organization, of course, but also more generally for the global fight against epidemic diseases. So in summary, I am pleased to report that CEPI has made great progress since its debut two years ago, and we'll let you hear more about the important work now underway from my colleagues. Super. Thank you, Richard. It's been a busy two years. Indeed. But one of the colleagues that, that you mentioned is certainly uh, uh, Jeremy and the, and the team at Welcome Trust. And Welcome Trust uh, was certainly was an integral to the launch of CEPI uh, and all the work since. So Jeremy, what does this <coughs> progress mean? And, and in your mind, what are the challenges that remain? Yeah, thanks very much, Ryan. And, and we should also, as Richard has done, just pay tribute to the, um, the role that the World Economic Forum played in getting us launched. It, it, it doesn't feel like it was just two years ago. Um, and Richard's outlined some of the progress that's been made technically, but, but perhaps doesn't um, put it into context quite enough. Um, I think what CEPI has essentially done is, is it's changed the way that we think about epidemics. Um, you know, it, it has changed that paradigm. Two years ago, persuading people that you could do research in the context of an epidemic was, people laughed at you. It just was not possible. Um, the thought of pooling resources, because none of us can do this on their own. Welcome can't do it. Gates Foundation can't do it. Germany, Japan, Norway, we can't do this on our own. But by pooling the resources, we have the opportunity to do so. And I was in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo with Tedros uh, over New Year. And, and, and somebody that was there said, you know, having a vaccine changes what was a frightening, fearful condition into something with hope. And, and, and that's what a vaccine can do. Um, and for the first time, you've been able to deploy already the Merck vaccine very soon, the J&J &J vaccine, in DRC, in the surrounding countries, and there is nobody who's been there in any doubt that this is having a major impact on that epidemic. That epidemic, which is probably going on now for six to nine months, would have spread geographically and into some big cities without the impact of uh, the response that's happened. And, and CEPI's reputation in this area has just changed the way people think about things. Um, and it is staggering to think that's happened in, in, in two years. Um, I think it's also important when you put a partnership together, nobody should underestimate the challenges of, of getting married. Nobody yeah. should underestimate the challenges of bringing disparate parties together. But ask yourself in the two years, who's left? And who of the original partners that joined are still there? And, and as you heard, Canada and Australia, uh, Belgium all increasing their, their contributions, the UK joining as Richard's just announced. All of the original partners are there and have remained committed. Merck and J&J &J critically, uh, and all the rest of us. And that's a tribute to Richard's leadership, to the governance, and I think to an appreciation that while CEPI hasn't got everything right yet, and there are some real challenges, nevertheless, the, the governance, the structure, the leadership, and still the concept is the right one. And I think CEPI is more important today than it was two years ago. Mm. And I think it's, in a, it's laid a great foundation for changing the way we think about the development of vaccines for diseases, which we all have to appreciate, will never have a true commercial return. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, and thank you for being one of those original partners. And, and, and Lydia, you, MSD, is another one of those original partners. And uh, as Jeremy alluded to, uh, also MSD is uh, behind the, the Ebola vaccine that's been such a game changer in the current response. Could you speak to what it has meant to have a vaccine available? 
Absolutely. And first, I'd, I'd just like to underscore everything that Richard and Jeremy just said. We strongly believed at uh, our companies known as Merck in the United States and Canada and MSD around the rest of the world, so don't want any confusion on that point. Um, MSD felt and still does that CEPI is absolutely essential to global health security, and that's why we were involved um, from the very get-go and remain committed as a, as a partner. Um, Jeremy said it correctly, a uh, vaccine is hope. And uh, our Ebola vaccine, experimental Ebola vaccine, has been used um, in the current outbreak in DRC to vaccinate approximately 60,000 people as of today. We are fully committed to having a, a stockpile of 300,000 doses at the ready. We've shipped 100,000 to WHO already, and we'll ship another approximately 120,000 by the end of next month. So uh, we are as excited as anyone on the face of the globe could be to be a part of this incredible partnership and to be able to supply our exper experimental vaccine in partnership with CEPI, in partnership with the World Economic Forum, in partnership with WHO, and critically in partnership with regulatory authorities in both the United States and in Europe. Without their um, collaboration, this vaccine could not have been um, put into production and put into use as quickly as it has been. So we're very grateful for that as well. Thank you, Lydia, and thank you for, for your, your leadership. I think we've all seen, seen the headlines that this, uh, the vaccine and that intervention has saved countless lives. So it's just a different place to be than where we have been in the past. Uh, Paul. You, you were on the stage two years ago, and uh, you and Johnson & Johnson have been on many of those stages where these global health challenges have been addressed through, through uh, innovative public-private cooperation. Could you reflect on, on CEPI's partnership model that's been kind of behind this progress for, for two years and what that progress has meant and, and the path ahead? Yes, I can. And um, first of all, uh, uh, thank you for organizing this update. CEPI uh, has become and is a very important vehicle uh, in the future of research of vaccines for global health security. And um, it, research and development in vaccines is a long-term part. It's not that we do something today and next morning you or next year you will have a vaccine. You have to have a sustained research, early stage development, late stage development, combining academic, other type of research teams uh, with industry in order to, to get to the final product. And that's where CEPI is such an important catalyst on bringing academic and industry together to get ready for the next uh, set of outbreaks. And we have the, with, as an industry, we have the vaccine platforms to be able to provide vaccine on a large scale. The scientific community is absolutely needed to tackle so many different pathogens. Um, with CEPI, we have engaged together with Oxford in base in the in the in the star in the new research on MERS, Lassa, and NIPA, uh, funded by CEPI. Um, and with that, we brought together a very strong research team, the platforms we have, and the production capabilities to bring forward uh, three vaccines. One MERS was already in a very good stage at Oxford in order to take on the next stage. We provide a vaccine platform to upscale it up to phase two, so that we can get to a clinical trial as soon as somewhere there is an, a, clinic, a, a clinical outbreak which where it could be it could be used and and that's especially the 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 CEPI approach um, as also thanks to the UK government initiative on putting up a vaccine uh, production platform which could host this type of um, vaccines and that's a quite significant investment from the UK government in order to also, I think, in an ideal situation, um, to, uh, to, to have the production available. Um, Lassa Nipa is early stage there. We have to start preclinical research. It will take some time before we have the next step. And also there, if that is positive, CEPI will step back in to uh, see how we can further collaborate. Um, we are working together since a long time on Ebola. Ebola um, has been a research part for us for more than 10 years uh, in order to get to a vaccine which can be widely used in uh, healthcare workers as well in a large population. Uh, today we are in a stage that we have done a clinical trial 
together with support from the US government, from IMI, and soon from CEPI on how we can expand in the region. Uh, we have vaccinated more than 6,000 people, have done all the animal rule work in order to get uh, the approval with Europe and the US, and we will make our vaccine available. We have about 6 million, uh, sorry, 1.6 uh, million vaccines available currently, and we have a vaccine production platform which can increase that very quickly if one day it would be needed. Why Prime Boost? We, uh, we worked on a vaccine for the long-term protection of healthcare workers and, 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 and focused on safety and long-term protection. Um, we have the product the production platform, but also worked on stability with the help of, of, uh, of international funders, where we can bring the, the, a normal refrigeration temperatures two to eight Celsius for one year, uh, and it's stable in the normal vaccine system. So you have to think about so many things if you want to va bring vaccines to, uh, to, uh, to the global uh, field. And that's now in, in state of discussion with, uh, with the regulatory authorities and the WHO on how we can deploy that on a larger scale in the region for Ebola. Um, but this would not happen if it would not have happened and the whole of this vaccine uh, activities would not have happened without this extreme collaboration between government, um, Wellcome Trust, Gates Foundation, many other institutions, as well as the industry. And I think it serves as an example on how to solve uh, global public health issues which are of major concern to the world. Hmm? Thank you, Paul. And thank you to each of our panelists. Uh, I think at this point, uh, with our remaining time, we'd like to turn uh, to the room to see if there are any questions here in the room. Uh, and if you do have a question, we ask that you would please state your name and, and your affiliation before uh, addressing our panelists. Seeing none, uh, would be remiss if we didn't ask if any of the panelists had one or two more messages they would like to convey to our to our audience? Sure, I'll, 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 I'll start. I think um, Paul, Paul spoke eloquently to the challenges of addressing vaccine development against these diseases. He spoke about the partnership between industry, the critical partnership between industry, governments, academia. Um, Jeremy reflected on his visit to the DRC and the challenges of actually delivering vaccines in a, in a very complicated environment. I, I just want to underscore one more thing about CEPI, which is, um, you know, we I spoke in my comments mainly about the activities that CEPI has funded and undertaken relating to vaccine development. And that, that is a critical part of CEPI as an organization, as a product development partnership. CEPI is also, the C in CEPI stands for coalition. And, and the coalition aspect of what CEPI is doing is critically important. We, we do bring together partners to the table that are beyond you know, the, the, the part of CEPI that funds vaccine development. I, I just returned from a week in uh, Nigeria. Uh, Nigeria CDC hosted the, the first international Lhasa fever conference last week uh, and had over 600 researchers, uh, 100 investigators from other parts of Africa outside of Nigeria traveled to the conference, 200 international uh, participants. And we had an opportunity to convene CEPI's Joint Coordination Group, which is our, our roundtable of partners. Uh, it includes multilateral partners like WHO, like Gavi, like UNICEF, uh, the IFRC. We were able to take our vaccine manufacturers who are working on lots of vaccines, including Oxford, uh, the partner with, with Janssen, uh, and to meet with representatives of, of, of Nigerian government, the, the regulatory bodies, the ethical uh, review boards, to discuss collectively how we can collectively take responsibility for these products. And I think the idea that CEPI puts forward um, is that we all have collective responsibility. CEPI as a funding body cannot do this um, by itself. It cannot do this without the partnership of our industry partners with, with Merck's, Janssen's, with the biotech firms, with our academic partners, with other funders like, like Welcome. Um, and, that, and that to address these truly global threats, we do have to respond to them as a global community, and we've tried to embody that. Uh, I think the success of the model to date, uh, which has generated a lot of promise, we have a lot of work to do, there are many challenges ahead, as, as Jeremy said, I, I think speaks to the validity of, of the model of, of, of gathering in and working together. That's right. We do have a question? Please. Yeah. Let's get a microphone. No. 
Okay. No, I think we're happy, please. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Sophie Edwards from DevEx. Mm -hmm. uh, question for you, Richard. Um, you mentioned a partnership with Ethiopia. It would be great to just hear a bit more detail about that, how that's gonna work. And also, how, um, how do you select which which things you're working on? Is there sort of outside pressure to maybe in include some other things like influenza? Or, and how do you sort of navigate those? Sure, so let me, let me speak to the question about Ethiopia first. I think, I think um, we are working with Ethiopia to, to uh, figure out how their commitment will work. They do want to join CEPI as a full member of the coalition and that, that actually entails making a contribution to the common pool of funding. We think it's incredibly important that, again, speaking to this idea of a global coalition, this is, this is not a problem that just Western funders uh, or, or rich nations can solve. It is, it is critically important to have partners who are potentially affected by these diseases, almost uniformly, of which are lower and middle income countries, uh, that's, that's where emerging diseases tend to emerge, uh, be part of CEPI, be part of its governance. Um, Ethiopia um, does actually face risk from a number of the diseases that CEPI is working on. Now that we've added Rift Valley fever, that, that's also a consideration. We, we know that MERS is present in camel populations in, in Ethiopia. We do not know because of weak surveillance whether there are human cases there. But Ethiopia um, responded very favorably um, to our initial overtures and, and did express interest. They're an ambitious country. They want to build a biotechnology industry. Um, they host the African Union. They host Africa CDC. Um, the director of Africa CDC is a CEPI board member. So the, the linkages were natural and um, we, are, we are working with them uh, through some currency issues to figure out how um, they, they can be fully contributing members to the partnership. Um, the second question, very briefly, uh, you asked how we selected uh, the agents that we've worked on. I, I think we take our lead from um, the, the global leader in this space, which is the World Health Organization. Uh, they, in, through their uh, R&D blueprint for action against epidemic disease, have identified high priority pathogens and urgent pathogens. Um, MERS, Lhasa, Nipah, and Rift are all among, among the highest priority pathogens. Chikungunya is a, is a disease that they have also expressed that the world needs to make progress on. So we have followed their lead. We've had to down select from the total list um, just because of constraints of resources at present. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, Richard. Lydia, you had a point too, and then Paul? Yeah, I, I just wanted to add that the, the use of our experimental uh, Ebola vaccine in DRC, I think is, uh, the backdrop is the volatility of viruses, but also the unpredictability of the environments in which they may need to be used. And looking back at the unprecedented rapidity with which um, our experimental vaccine was developed and deployed, we are very, very hopeful that this will uh, be a new model for developing and quickly deploying life-saving vaccines, uh, life-saving hope, as Jeremy said earlier. Paul? Yeah, I think, uh, Lydia, what, what you say is very important uh, for industry to, to, to participate in this. Uh, today, we develop cancer drugs in the West in three years, yeah, from the first clinical result to getting it out to patients. This is a global health security. We have to get the regulatory path and the clinical pathway to get this done very clear. And that will give us a very good view on what we have to do and what we can expect uh, when we are investing, because typically we as companies co-invest in getting this done. Um, it will be much clearer on and bringing more partners on board to uh, to get this going. And there, the world has to align between FDA, EMA, the World Health Organization, and all the constituents who are involved on a very clear pathway for for how to move forward and uh, and the development pathway. Yeah. Mm -mm. So I think this is when you, you Ryan at the start you asked what are the what are the what's it going to look like in the future? I mean, I I would characterise that CEPI. Um, has come onto the scene. There's no doubt it's changed the dynamic and the language around what's used, and it's invested in a series of, of what look like very exciting pipelines and others to develop new vaccines. CEPI will truly have, have succeeded, though, if it changes the way we all think about the R&D of 
of vaccines to begin with, at least. Um, and Paul's comment there and Lydia's about, unless we think of this as from start to finish, which means realigning the regulatory pathways, the the access issues, uh, and, and you know, complicated things like intellectual property and, and, and pricing, unless we think of it in the round, and CEPI, given that it's trusted status now, is the forum, I believe, which can bring people together and have those debates. It, it's a technical body, funding R&D, but it's also a body that's a forum to bring all of those parties together. And in truth, that doesn't exist anywhere else. And I think in the long term, CEPI's greatest contribution will be developing the vaccines, but it will also be in changing the way we think about their development. Thank you, Jeremy. And, and, and I think what we can then plan to do is, is reconvene here and visit that progress as uh, CEPI continues to catalyze those activities. I think we've seen that uh, thanks to CEPI, there's now a, a different set of expectations. We've changed the conversation. Um, and so we'll continue to catalyze those, those uh, activities that now the world expects. So now it's time to deliver. And thank you to those on the panel who have delivered so far. And we appreciate the update and learning of the progress. Thank, thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you.